Hey, welcome to another vodcast of American history. Uh, in this unit, we're going to be talking about overseas expansion, or more specifically, U.S. imperialism. So let's go ahead and get started. Here's your objectives for this unit. There are several. Again, as we go through this unit, if the slides progress too quickly, feel free to uh, you know finish watching this one, but then go back and watch just the Prezi if you are uh, needing to capture the notes, and you can find that on Blackboard. So the overall question is why? Why does the United States become this imperialist nation? Um, other European nations are imperialistic by nature. Uh, they go out and they seek out new colonization. Uh, England obviously being an example of that, establishing colonies in America, but also in India and Africa. Uh, France is involved in it, and later on as we uh, learn through this unit, you'll see that G Germany and also Japan get involved. So essentially the United States has to get involved for global competition or, or fears it's going to be left behind. Now the United States is uh, small. It will, it will establish a small empire eventually, but it's late to the game, so to speak. And the reason it's late, uh, we'll get to in just a moment. Um, but the United States government and leaders of the country realize that uh, we have to become imperialistic to stay globally competitive Plus, due to industrial expansion, agricultural expansion, we have a massive surplus of goods uh, and we have nothing to do with. Our market is saturated. There are so many uh, you know, bushels of wheat that Americans can buy and consume. There's only so many vacuum cleaners and typewriters that Americans need. So uh, our, our capitalist industrialists are mass producing because that's profit making. You know, run, your, run your factories at 99% capacity. So basically, we're saturated. We're looking for, we need a new, we need a new market. A thirst for new markets is essentially what we're looking at here. Um, there's a lot of social unheaval uh, or upheaval, I should say, uh, in regards to populism. The farmers are upset, which we learned in the last unit. There's a lot of labor strikes. Uh, the, the the workers are not happy with their their hours, their pay, their conditions, uh, and so that forces the politicians to finally realize they have to do something. So they stepped up this aggressive foreign policy, again, to seek out uh, new markets. And those new markets are found in Europe, Latin America, and Asia. Again, why are we late to the game? Well, most of the 1800s, we have been spent practicing manifest destiny, which is the expansion from the East Coast to West Coast. Now, I know we're studying the 1800s, specifically the late 1800s, but you could argue that Manifest Destiny has been practiced in the United States or the continental United States uh, as we know it since 16, uh, 1600, 1606 with the founding of Jamestown. From that moment on, we began expanding. Uh, and it's all because of a, a belief in cultural superiority, which we will get to later on. Um, it seems like we're getting to a lot of stuff later on. Um, but... We do finally expand East Coast to West Coast, and I think by 1870, we have expanded all the way coast to coast with the Transcontinental Railroad. So we have conquered this continent under the guise of Manifest Destiny. Uh, we realize, the leaders of the country realize that it has worked so well that they take this belief in cultural superiority and apply it to expansion outside the United States. One more time, Manifest Destiny is expansion in the country. Imperialism is expansion outside the country. They justify imperialism because of the success of Manifest Destiny, this God-given right to conquer, Christianize, and civilize the world. Um, early efforts, 1867, we acquire Midway Islands, Small set of islands, no one knew about. We took them. They were uninhabited. No one cared. We used them as a coaling station, uh, or uh, more commonly referred to as a refueling station. Coal was the main source of fuel for our uh, steam-powered ships. Uh, so it was a midway, literally a midway point between the um, United States and Asia. We purchased Alaska for $7.2 million in 1867 also. Um, that did not come easily. There was a lot of uh, protest from the civil citizens of the country, mainly because Reconstruction was going on at the time, and a lot of people argued that $7.2 million could do a lot for helping rebuild the South, again referring back to uh, the topic of national politics where the country was literally divided within political parties. 
um, not only just divided between Republican and Democrat ideologies, but also Republicans themselves divided on how to reconstruct the South. There were other attempts um, to reach out and acquire territories outside the United States early, early, early on, Cuba, Canada, Mexico, Dutch West Indies, all of which were unsuccessful. <clears throat> a quick view of the Midway Islands just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Here's the uh, islands of Hawaii. So Midway is just, uh, oh, I don't know, about 1,000 miles north. This this was important in 1867. Uh, this has huge uh, ramifications for World War II. Should the United States not have taken these islands, Japan would have, and that would have given them an easy launching point uh, to the United States for World War II. They would not have had to focus on Pearl Harbor. Uh, Hawaii. Uh, quick information about Midway. Today it is a vacation spot uh, based on the reading and you can follow the link seen here. You uh, you can go, you have to get uh, special approval like months in advance, but you can go for one or two days to explore and, and take care of things. Uh, their big issue, it's run by the National Wildlife uh, portion of Congress or portion of the government. Um, their biggest concern is to protect the natural coral reef that is uh, surrounding the island, and you can kind of see that there in the picture. <clears throat> uh, pic this is a painting of uh, the purchase of Alaska. Uh, William Seward, the Secretary of State at the time for um, President Lincoln, acted without congressional approval. He was pretty sure they were going to give it to him. They, he was pretty sure they were going to write the check, but he went ahead before Congress even approved. But uh, just a quick painting there to show the purchase of Alaska here, and here's the actual note. Difficult to read, but it is a note, a uh, bank note for $7.2 million to be paid to Russia. And for some reason, I like it when polar bears fall down and slide down the ice. And yes, I have a sick sense of humor when people fall downstairs. Reminds me of a joke I knew. What do people and slinkies have in common? They're both pointless, but they're fun to push downstairs. <laughs> now, I'm not going to push people downstairs. Anyhow. Let's continue. Reasons for United States expansion. Again, industrialization. The factories pr were producing at 99% capacity. Farmers were growing huge, enormous amounts of crops. Uh, the United States gave 160 acres free. Farmers then bought more land because of the new machinery. They could cultivate, harvest, and, and grow more. Um, and so we just have this massive surplus. The Bonanza farms were putting uh, multitudes of uh, surplus on the market. Prices were going way down, and, of course, the farmers and the populace are upset about that. So we need to find a new market to help drive up prices, help drive up demand. Um, yep, efficiency uh, of the markets there or of the uh, factories there. And, of course, world travel, specifically our ships, um, we be we start to build new battleships, new cruisers. Our Navy uh, improves with the Great White Fleet. The new vessels, the new steel-hulled vessels, allow us to travel uh, quickly, more quickly than before, uh, more efficiently than before, and safer because it, it is steel uh, versus the old wood and ironclad uh, ships. And, of course, this belief of cultural superiority, the Anglo-Saxon race, um, you're, you're, we're going to watch real quick here a few slides on this origin. This is not a uh, an American ideal. This is not an, uh, a, a belief that Americans are superior. Americans, Caucasians, are descendants from the Anglo-Saxon uh, race. And it has its tracings all the way back to, uh, at the earliest recordings, is 550 A.D. So let's just take a quick look. Um, at the beginnings of that. Again, Manifest Destiny. This is a very famous uh, painting of destiny leading the way, leading uh, leading the uh, settlers across the West. And uh, again, that worked very well in the United States, so it kind of justifies United States imperialism or American imperialism. Uh, quick look at American uh, Manifest Destiny in, this, in the country. So we see the, the forming of the colonies. After the French and Indian War, we have uh, all of this territory inland, to the Mississippi River. Purchase of Louisiana from France by Thomas Jefferson gives us all this territory. The Mexican-American War uh, cedes this territory to us, and then James K. Polk simply takes this territory. Quick timeline. 
Uh, we'll zoom in on different parts at, at some point. So you can see the earliest recorded date is 550. But the Anglo-Saxon culture, the Anglo-Saxon race, we're not sure where it began. But we have an idea of, of the location of its of its beginnings in the Caucasus Mountain regions. And just a quick idea where that is. You can see here just south of Russia and east of the uh, the Black Sea. That's the Caucasus Mountains. Worldview, we are looking at right here. These Aryans have this belief from the very beginning that they are superior and that they should not mix. Well, a group of the Aryans breaks off, moves south, and they mix with the peoples of Arabia. Again, Arabia mean, being right here. So with a, a, a group of Aryans break away, move away, migrate to Arabia, and they intermix with the peoples there. The Aryans, with their belief that they are better than everybody else, see this as an atrocity. And to get away from this, to completely separate th themselves from this, to shun those members of the Aryan nation that did this, they moved north. And they settle in what is known as the Jutland Peninsula, and they change their names to the Teutons. Jutland Peninsula, today we know that is Denmark, Sweden uh, region. Well, as fate would have it, a part of the Teutons get antsy, and they break away, and they move south, and they intermix with the people of the Italian Peninsula. Again, following their belief of superiority, vowing to keep their pure race alive, shunning those people who migrated away and broke with tradition and culture and belief, they move yet again into the Great Britain Peninsula. And this is where we see the beginnings around 550 A.D. So Jutland Peninsula, and we start to see these people moving. And uh, as you can see here, the different colors, we have Jutes, Angles, and Saxons. And if you look, we have the Anglo-Saxon race beginning here, the intermixing of all of this Caucasian uh, groups of people. They form together and form essentially what will become one of the greatest empires of the world, equal to, if not better, than Rome. England moves on, establishes the colonies, the colonies rebel, colonies gain their independence, they form the United States, the United States grows, and presidents begin to acquire land. One example of that is Thomas Jefferson in 1804, James K. Polk with Oregon Territory, and uh, the, the uh, California Territory. And then under other presidents, we acquire the Midway, we take Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, Cuba, and the Philippines. This is not purely an American ideal. The whole point of that little slideshow is that this, this idea is, uh, for lack of a better term, inbred in our genes, that we are superior, that Caucasians are superior, and it's our right to take over, Christianize, civilize, and make others like us. All that information can be found from a book by James Bradley called The Imperial Cruise. I hope to have an audio portion of that section posted uh, here soon. Another reason for American imperialism is, again, global competition, competition with European nations and, of course, religion. Going back to the idea of Anglo-Saxon superiority, we believed that uh, it was our duty, our burden, so to speak, to Christianize and civilize the heathen savages of the world. There are several different types of empires. We, the United States, was not interested in, in securing an empire like England. We did not want colonies around the world. We wanted uh, economic ties. We wanted markets to sell our goods to. We did not want to take physical control. We, uh, we felt like it was our duty to establish our national prestige and keep our nation prestigious. And by taking territories around the world, we would see that as hypocritical going back to the days of Revolutionary War where we fought to free ourselves from that type of rule. We knew it would be costly to maintain. A large military requires high taxes, and we did not want to place that burden upon the United States citizens. Uh, the majority of Americans, however, did not believe that there was a constitutional authority nor method of taking uh, new territories, acquiring new territories. So a lot of citizens were opposed to expansion because there was no constitutional authority. Versus today, 
where people are arguing that the Constitution is out of date and should be thrown out. These people stuck to, they were constitutional, uh, strict uh, followers. Spheres of influence. These are little pockets of um, military, economic power. The United States gets involved in this. Let's start with Alfred T. Mahan. He is the Secretary of the Navy at the time, and he urges Congress that if we are going to seek out these new territories, seek out these new markets, establish ourselves overseas, we have to have a way to protect those American investments. If we want to buy sugar plantations in Cuba, we have to be able to protect the American property and the American people working on those plantations in foreign countries. So he encourages Congress to build up the Navy. And one example of that is the Great White Fleet. Nine new steel-hauled vessels, which uh, were painted white. That's why they're called the Great White Fleet. Uh, and this was an example of our growing military force in the world, but the military was growing not for military reasons, it was for economic reasons. We did establish a few uh, small bases in the Pacific, Midway and Pearl Harbor being two of those as uh, refueling uh, stations. And again, we do get involved in the sugar trade in foreign countries of Hawaii and Cuba. We'll talk more about that in a few moments. Um, in regards to the tariff, McKinley tariff was passed and Let's talk specifically about Hawaii. Hawaiian uh, sugar plantations are owned by U.S. citizens living in Hawaii. Now, let's clarify something. Early, early on, 18, oh, I don't know, 1830s, 1820s, United States, American missionaries go to Hawaii uh, and do what missionaries do. And it's a good it's a good work. I don't want to criticize religion in any way. Missionaries do the work that they believe is right. They do the work peacefully. They try to Christianize and convert people to their religion. Well, those missionaries in Hawaii stay. They have children, and their children have children. So these U.S. sugar growers are the grandchildren of these missionaries. They're still considered American citizens at the time. We enjoy or I should say those sugar growers enjoy tax-free uh, importation of Hawaiian sugar into the United States in exchange for the United States building a base at Pearl Harbor, Japan. So under the rule of King David Kalakaua, there is an agreement between the United States and Navy. We will import uh, Hawaiian sugar for free if you allow us to build Pearl Harbor. And that's all well and good. Then the McKinley Tariff comes along. Um, and it changes things. Pearl Harbor is now built. Hawaii has no cards in the game, so to speak. So we, the United States, the McKinley Tariff passes, places a 48% tax on uh, imports. It actually creates a new list of items that are going to be taxed. It creates a new list of items that are not going to be taxed. Well, among those things that are is uh, uh, Hawaiian sugar. 48%, that's insane. That's an insane amount of tax to sell your sugar in the United States. So Hawaiian, uh, the sugar growers in Hawaii see a, an enormous loss of, loss of profit in their future. So they are forced to act. And the only way to get rid of that tariff is to become a U.S. territory. So they act upon that and they, uh, the king dies, the queen takes over, the queen wants to return uh, Hawaii back to its original state and they they, they, they uh, kind of stage a rebellion and the queen steps down. Anyhow, they get control of the Hawaiian Islands, and they asked for annexation. Now, it doesn't happen right away. It's not until, like, 1897 that the uh, islands are annexed. But this uh, McKinley Tariff is a major player in that uh, takeover of Hawaiian Islands. Uh, Cuban sugar, also taxed, but we do not have as many fields in uh, Cuba, nor do we have uh, the political influence, I would say, from the U.S. growers the way Hawaii did. Uh, there were a lot of congressmen. There was the Secretary of State all involved in Hawaii. It was a major, uh, essentially, it was a coup d'etat by the United States in Hawaii. Um, again, there is a huge expense in establishing colonies around the world versus an empire. Uh, you can establish one colony, let's say like Hawaii, and you maintain that versus an empire of, oh, I don't know, all of Spain 
that you know, just making up examples here, huge cost involved, and we didn't want to get involved in that. There's also the moral dilemma. Do we want to govern other races? Booker T. Washington was a huge opponent of imperialism. Uh, his his firm belief was we have our own racial issues in the United States that we have not dealt with. The black-white issue has not been dealt with. Why? Why would we want to incorporate other issues, races into this argument when we can't deal with the ones that exist already? And Andrew Carnegie, as wealthy as Carnegie was, as reliant upon the world market as Carnegie was, and as successful he was, he knew the, uh, the importance of world trade. He still believed that we did not have to own people to trade with them. So a lot of anti-imperialists opposed to this. This leads to the Spanish-American War. Um, now that we're involved worldwide, we start to feel like, you know, if we have these markets in overseas and there's a, there's a war or there's a rebellion, there's an uprising, there's some kind of civil uh, dispute going on, that's going to impact us. And, that you know, that reigns true today. One example, again, of the Spanish-American War. U.S.-owned sugar fields in Cuba are being threatened by uh, the rebels. Um, they This is actually the, the Spanish-American War. Per, right before the Spanish-American War, there is a second Cuban rebellion. The first Cuban rebellion was around 1868. Uh, it lasts 10 years. Completely unsuccessful. Uh, mainly because the world did not recognize the Cubans' right to rebel. They were The world wasn't necessarily ready to face Spain. So no one gave any kind of um, credence to the Cubans' rebellion uh, in 1868. So that one, you know, lasts for 10 years, n but nothing happens. Uh, they may give the Cubans some sovereignty, but not much. The biggest thing that happens after the first Cuban rebellion is the United States buying up some sugar fields from Spain to kind of show some good diplomatic uh, relationship uh, good intention, so to speak, with Spain. Well, the second revolution comes along, and uh, Jose Marti encourages the rebels to burn U.S. sugar fields and make it look like the Spanish soldiers are doing it. He knew this would provoke the United States because it was our job. It was our belief. We made it very well known that we were going to protect our property uh, by any means necessary. Uh, Spain is tired of the rebellion. You know, again, this being number two, um, Spain essentially gives their general free reign to put down the rebellion in any way possible. And so General Valiano Weiler's uh, approach is to round up the rebels and put them in concentration camps. He's given the nickname the Butcher because he has no sympathy for the Cubans. 300,000 Cubans are rounded up. This reaches U.S. newspapers, and uh, the two big newspapers at the time were uh, the New York World and the New York Press, one by Joseph Pulitzer of the famous Pulitzer Prize, another William Randolph Hearst. Well, these two editors, these two owners of these newspapers were involved in a massive campaign against each other to see who could sell the most papers. They used yellow journalism, and the whole point of their idea of yellow journalism was to sell papers, not to gain support for the war, not to uh, show how bad Spain was. It was to sell newspapers. So they would take this idea and stretch the truth, and that's what yellow journalism uh, does. So um, they publish these stories about concentration camps in Cuba, and to be quite honest, these concentration camps, if you were to look at pictures of the Cuban Cubans in the concentration camps in 1898, uh, and place a picture of Jewish prisoners in Holocaust camps in you know 1943. They would be very very similar. In fact, if you were to see one, most people would pick uh, the pictures of the Cuban in Cubans in concentration camps as Holocaust victims. That's how bad those camps were. Um, another reason for the Spanish American War: Spanish ambassador uh, Enrique de Lome is asked by the king of Spain to give them some feedback. You know, what's the climate uh, of the country? What's the political climate? What What is McKinley thinking? Um, and through his research, Enrique de Lome realizes that McKinley is not uh, in any kind of uh, way preparing for war, mainly because the United States population has not jumped to that side. It, it, the things in Spain have not, or things in Cuba have not progressed severely enough for people to 
uh, be all in favor of war. Yes, they're upset. Yes, they sympathize with Cuba. Yes, they are giving aid to Cuba as independent individual citizens, but they're not quite ready to uh, be completely in favor of the war. And McKinley, uh, wanting to listen to the people, McKinley, wanting to get reelected by the people, chooses to listen and not declare war. Well, according to DeLome at the time, that is a sign of a weak leader. So in his letter back to Spain, he calls McKinley weak and tells him that McKinley will not do anything that the public does not favor. Well, somehow that telegraph is intercepted, and Hearst and Pulitzer run the story for weeks at a time. And when they print the stories that DeLome has called McKinley weak, the public becomes enormously outraged. Not everybody agreed with McKinley. Not everyone voted for McKinley. But he was still the U.S. president. And this, at the time, around 1900, is when we still had a deep respect for the leader of our country. Whether we voted or believed in his ideas or not, we still respected our president versus contrasting to today, which if you don't vote for our current president, you absolutely hate him. Um, totally, totally different. So this letter is published in the papers, and it actually does turn the tide, and there's a big shift toward uh, going to war. People very much in favor of going to war because how dare you how dare you call our president weak? And then finally, with the destruction of our U.S. sugar fields, uh, using our military presence, the USS Maine is sent to Cuba to protect American lives and property, not to threaten Spain, not to threaten the Cubans, but only to protect American lives and property, just to make sure our property is secure. Well, the USS Maine uh, blows up, and all fingers point to Spain. So you can kind of get an idea that, uh, it's a domino effect. You know, we have uh, our sugar plantations being burnt, made, being made to look like Span Spanish soldiers did it. Uh, the Cubans being put in concentration camps. We have a Spanish ambassador calling our president weak. So naturally, it, USS Maine blows up. It would only occur or only, only assume to be natural that, yeah, Spain blew it up. Later on, investigations find that it was a faulty boiler system. The boiler uh, explodes, and uh, it's too close to the powder magazine. And so the whole ship blows up, killing 266 or 265 Americans. But the public doesn't care. The newspapers know the story. They offer a $50,000 reward to find those Spanish scoundrels who blew up the ship. Uh, and so that's just a driving force. And that pushes America over the edge. And McKinley declares or asks Congress to declare war in April of 1898. Here's a painting recreation or recreated of uh, the explosion of the USS Maine. It's a four-month war, extremely short. In four months, we destroy the once world power of Spain. The first engagement is at Manila Bay, and in six hours, we wipe out this, the Pacific fleet of Spain. The next few engagements are in Cuba. We take Kettle Hill. We take San Juan Hill, of which uh, we see Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders gave, gaining some fame there. And then the Battle of Santiago Bay essentially ends the war. Uh, quick statistic here, 5,500 Americans die. No one dies in Manila Bay. Only one American died in Santiago Bay. Most of the Americans die in the fighting that takes place on San Juan Hill and Kettle Hill. Only few hundred, excuse me, 400, only 400 soldiers die from battle. 5,000 die from tainted meat. Think back to our study about cattle drives and the Chicago slaughterhouses. The meat that was being packed in cans had all kinds of goodies in it. Feces, rat tails, disease. That canned meat, which was a nude commodity, was being sent to our soldiers, and our soldiers were dying from dysentery from that. It's kind of a shame. The war itself does create a huge uh, burst of national pride. And the United States becomes known as a world power. Through the Treaty of Paris, we gain territories of the of Puerto Rico, Guam. We pay Spain $20,000 for the Philippines just as a way of saying, yo, we're really sorry we beat you so badly. Here's some money uh, just in case you might need it somewhere. And then we uh, also get Cuba, not as a territory, but as a protectorate and 
we decide to stay in Cuba to help them set up their government. Um, the Four Acre Act makes Puerto Ricans U.S. citizens in 1917. Uh, in regards to the Philippines, uh, there's a little bit more serious issue there. Uh, back to Cuba, we help them set up their government. We force Cuba to accept the Platt Amendment. Um, otherwise, the United States military stays and runs the place under martial law. Well, they eventually do accept the Platt Amendment in their constitution. And we enjoy, wow, for like 50 years, we enjoy a good economic uh, partnership with Cuba before Fidel Castro uh, assassinates his way into power. And then from there, uh, negotiations and all kinds of, all, all terms end at that point. Um, again, just a few facts about the war, Treaty of Paris. Philippine-American War uh, lasts four years versus the four-month war against Spain. Uh, part of the reason is because it's jungle fighting, it's guerrilla warfare. The Philippines have the help of the of the uh, citizens there. The Philippines, from their point of view, it, we they had simply traded one tyrant for another. They, they fought alongside the United States uh, to free themselves from Spain. They thought that they were going to get their sovereignty and control of the territory. Well, again, referring back to Anglo-Saxon superiority, we believe that since they had been under the control of Spain for so long that they did not know how to govern themselves. So we, we took it upon ourselves. It's our duty to help them we're going to, to establish a, a democracy there. So we're going to teach them how to do that. And uh, they did not see eye to eye with us. So a four-year war goes on. We finally do capture the rebels and attempt, and we do set up their government. It's not until 1946, though, that we finally turn the Philippines over and give them complete sovereignty uh, to the people. And finally, the open door notes. Around 1900, just start right there at the end of the uh, Spanish-American War, we get word that uh, Europe, European countries, England, Russia, Japan, Germany, well, I guess Japan's Asia, France, they are establishing uh, what we call spheres of influence Influence uh, in China. These are uh, pockets of political and ep economic power. These countries are mining and uh, gobbling up natural resources from China and then selling them <laughs> back to the Chinese. Sorry for the laugh. That just... It's just absurd. I'm going to move in, take this from you without your permission, and then force you to buy it from me. Uh, the United States, not wanting to get but left behind, the idea of global competition, um, wants to get involved. Se Secretary of State John Hay writes a letter to all the uh, foreign countries involved asking for, essentially, you know, give the United States a chance. Allow the United States to come over and play. Don't close the door, he says, on the, on the United States. And uh, he also, in his letter, he also suggests that China should be allowed to uh, remain or keep its integrity of its government. We should not try to overrun the government in any way, shape, or form. There's no response from any of the foreign governments involved. Um, but John Hay makes a public statement that everyone has unanimously agreed to allow the United States in. Little side note here, everyone was asked except China. The Chinese Empress at the time, extremely weak. China was in a bad state. The opium wars were going on. There were people lying in the streets, drugged out of their mind from opium. Um... Just things are just horrible, and that's one of the reasons why these foreign countries were able to come in so easily and s establish their presence uh, in China. Uh, but she, the Chinese Empress, uh, asks a religious group, the uh, Fists of Righteous Harmony, I think is one way to refer to them, one of the names, or the Society of Harmonious Fists is another one. If you do a search, you can probably do either one and come up with the same result. Uh, basically, it's a religious group. They practice martial arts. Um, Europeans, not seeing martial arts before, call them boxers because England and the United States, the closest thing we have to using our fists to defend ourselves is boxing, so we call them the boxers. But the Chinese emperors asked these, uh, this group to rid China of the white devils. So this group wants to do that. They are eager to help, willing to help. They honestly believe that their religion and their practice will block the white devil bullets uh, that can be fired at them. Um, yeah, they were greatly mistaken there. Uh, 
anyhow, they make the mistake of killing missionaries. They see the missionaries as not the primary uh, threat to their society, but a definite threat to their society. And a they are an unarmed and undefended uh, group of people. So they kill missionaries. They also kill Chinese converts to Christian Christianity. Um, several hundred people are killed by the boxers. And so these foreign countries send in their armies, and then it's a done deal after that. The United States also does send in some troops there. Um, so after it's all said and done, after the Boxer Rebellion is over, the damage inflicted throughout the war is placed upon who else? Well, of course, China. Why not? I mean, we're in your country, and you fight against us, and we beat you. Now you have to pay for the damages. Why not? That makes perfect sense. So that is imperialism and U.S. imperialism at the end of the 1800s at the turn of the century. Thanks, guys.